Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, listeners, to episode 28 of the Ad Nauseam podcast. My name is Jeff Winkle, and I'm here in the Vomitorium, as always, with my good friend and co-host, Dave Noe. How you doing, Dave? I'm doing very well, Jeff. I'm so excited about today's episode. Me too. I'm excited not only because the sun is out shining on the lake. We have a nice, beautiful view here. Spring is in the air. There's a lake next to the Vomitorium? There is a lake next to the Vomitorium, right, yeah. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Echolacos. And, um, but yeah, I'm excited about today's episode as, as well today. It's, it's a bit of a departure from our... Our, our usual time here. We're going to take a brief break from the Odyssey. Yes. And welcome our special guest, yes. Dr. Susan Weisbauer. Yes, it's going to it's going to be great. Uh, and what's she talking about today, generally? She's talking about a lot of stuff. Um, but her most recent project is on um, the study of medicine, mm-hmm. and she's going to be talking about Hippocrates, the the so called father of medicine in, oh, the, in the Western tradition. Absolutely. And, yes. But before we do that, you got a shout out for us today? I do. This goes to Mr. Max Wiggins, who was very precise in how I was supposed to pronounce his name. Really? Max Wiggins of Boca Raton, Florida. And he says, also, do me a favor, if you would, please, and give a shout out to all the faithful disciples of a most dear friend, hero, and mentor. He says, one of my all-time favorite people, uh, Reginald Reggie Foster. So Reggie Foster, a famous Latinist who uh, passed away Christmas. Very recently, right? That's right. Yeah. Christmas of 2020. There are a lot of uh, students and uh, disciples of Foster around the world who studied Latin with him. So Max wanted me to say hello, not only to him, but to all the Reginaldi. So excellent. Salute. Well, thank you. Thank you, Max, for the comments and for, for listening. Yeah. And Jeff, you have our opening quote this week, don't you? I do. This comes from a translation from the Hippocratic Corpus. And uh, it goes something like this. Whoever wishes to investigate medicine properly should proceed thus. In the first place to consider the seasons of the year and what effects each of them produces, for they are not all at all alike, but differ much from themselves in regard to their changes. Then the winds, the hot and the cold, especially such as are common to all countries, are then such as peculiar to each locality. Hmm. Fascinating. Yes. So that's going to be directly relevant to the conversation that uh, we're going to get into with Susan very soon. That's right. So let's get right to it. And we want to welcome Dr. Susan Weisbauer. Well, thank you so much, Susan. We're really, really grateful that you have uh, joined us this afternoon for our little podcast. And as we get started, uh, neither Jeff nor I know a great deal about your background. I mean, I know I know a little bit. I've studied a little bit of where you're coming from. You know, we have the standard online line bio. Uh, but many of our audience members may not be familiar with uh, your body of work. So could you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Yeah, sure. So um, I actually, I do, I do a number of different things. They're all sort of interrelated. Um, I'm a historian. Uh, I'm an educator. I started out actually in college as um, actually, I started as a music major before I realized that I hated performing. So <laughs> instead, I uh, became an English major because I liked to write. And, you know, I loved to practice. I just hated to perform. And essentially, writing is all practice. There's no perform, you know. Huh. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I found that that was that was a much uh, a much more mm, congenial uh, field of study for me. And I had always been fascinated by theology. I grew up in a in a very conservative, almost cultish, evangelical sort of church situation. And uh, I thought maybe I would like to do ancient Hebrew. And so I went to seminary and I did ancient Near Eastern language and literature at Westminster oh, wow. Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. Did, did you have, if I may ask, did you ever have Meredith Klein as an instructor? I did. I did. I was there right at the very end of he was only coming back and doing like one term credit J term classes. Okay. Um, but yes, yes, I, I had um, Tim Keller. I had Ray Dillard, um, Tremper Longman. Right. Uh, yeah. Yep. Was the, was Meredith wearing his trademark suits at the time still? He was, he was wearing his suits. He was. Ah, uh, that's wonderful. Yes. And, and, and he assigned all his own texts. Right. Uh, and we read them all. <laughs> yeah, he liked to say, uh, I think he said that his work consigned by oath uh, sounded like a C.S. Lewis title, right? Surprised by joy. But. It does a bit. It does yeah. a bit. 
I, 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 he was he was a fascinating lecturer. I wouldn't say that his prose style was comparable to Lewis's. No, that's a good point. No, he liked to hyphenate words. So I would agree with that. He kind of did this German thing where he'd just stick a whole bunch of words together with hyphens <laughs> between them to make a new vocabulary. So you sort of had to master um, his his vocabulary in order yes. to, to do well in the class. Yep. His idiosyncrasies. So, indeed. I, I think Westminster was in a very different place then than it is now. It was a good time to be there. Um, there was a lot of... Um, there was a lot of feeling in the student body at that time that women should not be part of the student body mm -hmm. because this was an Orthodox Presbyterian sure. seminary aimed at training men right. and for, for pastorship. And I was doing an MDiv because that was the best. That was a better degree than the Correct. MA that they had. And it was the first year that they had opened the MDiv up to women. Ah. And um, so it was a little bit of a tense time because I think the majority of the student body probably disagreed with that decision. Ultimately, hmm. it had been an accrediting decision, not um, a conviction decision. Sure. Yeah. So it was it was an interesting time. I mean, I learned I learned a lot about politics. at West ah, huh. And so you, you studied uh, Hebrew, you said, yeah. and yeah. Near Eastern languages. And then yeah. you also did some Greek. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I had done I was a Greek minor in college. OK. So and and I had taken Latin all through high school and into college. Uh, so, yeah. So adding Hebrew was like, you know, my my third big classical language. And I had really intended to go on and do a Ph.D. And I I think it's the writer side of me didn't want to spend the rest of my life writing things that five other people would read. <laughs> I can understand as, that, yeah. You know, as worthy as that is, I'm not knocking it. It's just sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I met my husband at Westminster. We got married. Um, I decided to take a little break. And then uh, when my, my second son was a baby, I went back to do an MA in 17th century literature uh, with an emphasis on devotional poetry and poetry and translation at the College of William and Mary. And then from that, I went on to do a PhD in American Studies. Uh, at a glance, it sounds uh, kind of like all over the map in terms of chronology and focus. And what do, uh, kind of connections do you make uh, between them? Like what led you from yeah. uh, study of ancient Hebrew to 7th century, 17th century devotional poetry to American studies? Well, the American studies, I ended up doing the PhD in American studies had a con I had a major concentration in the history of American religion. Mm -hmm. So I really think that what tied all of this together was my interest in theology okay um and my interest in languages i mean the the ma really focused on when i i say it was devotional poetry and poetry and translation my project was on translations of the 23rd psalm which were actually directed at kings or other people in power rather than at god you know how huh. these how these psalms were reworked to turn them into something else Interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, so I, I think that's what ties it all together. Uh, just an intense interest in words, an intense interest in how people use those words to either communicate with God or to pretend they're communicating with God while actually doing something much more human. Huh. Um, and that, now, you know, that continues to be a continues to be a fascination of mine. Right. So, did you have when you were studying Greek as an undergraduate? Were there particular authors in the Greek corpus that spoke to you more than others? Did you have a, a favorite or something that especially caught your interest? Hey, I'm going to be honest with you. All right. We, we used to say this in seminary that you either like Greek or you like Hebrew, but almost not. No, almost nobody likes both of them. Ah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I see where this is going. <laughs> I never really enjoyed Greek. Oh, Susan, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Breaking my heart. <laughs> I love Hebrew so much. Huh. Um, I loved Hebrew so much that my my prof my Hebrew professor. Um, Alan Groves, he's, he's, he's been dead now for a number of years, but what a wonderful, um, we had Alan Groves and Bruce Walkie. I don't know if you're familiar with these guys. Yes, I know Bruce um, Walkie. Yes, everybody knows Bruce Walkie. And uh, they used to have this, uh, this every year, there was one day that they called it the, the Day of the Champion, where one person was elected to take the quiz for the, uh, the or the test for the entire class, and everybody <laughs> got the grade that the champion oh, got on wow, that test. Oh, wow, wow. Right, no pressure, huh? Yeah. Um, so I was elected, and I I was the class champion, which I don't think a woman had ever done that before. Mm. But that was just because I loved Hebrew so much. Oh, that's I, wonderful. I, I, I endured Greek. 
Hmm. Well, I've been, study, I've been studying Hebrew poorly for about a decade, and <laughs> I would be in the other camp. Uh, yes. I, I just love Greek, but um, I've said this before on air, I think, in the words of St. Jerome, Hebrew is a broken-winded language. No! <laughs> no, so, so let me tell you, so if you, go, you have to go backwards a bit, but um, when, I, when I did my senior seminars, I was able to also study Akkadian, which, again, oh, is fascinating. And I was able to write out Genesis 1-1 in the actual lettering that probably would have been used mm. when that was first set down, physically set down. Yeah. And it was like it was like reaching back through time and touching something really, I mean, it was like touching the core of something. Um, kind of a, a hair on the back of your neck standing up kind of moment. Ab- absolutely. It yeah. Was. It was a oh, that's fantastic wonderful. experience. You know, so so I think history, because when you study languages, you're studying history. You know, you're, you're, you're right. dealing with how people have communicated over time. So I do think all of these things fit together. I would say the the standout, the weird thing, the MacGuffin mm-hmm. is, has been my work in home education. Okay. Which was kind of an accident. The thing that you're most known for, right? The, yes. Well, yeah. You know, that came about because I was home educated myself. Right. My mother, who is a, a certified teacher, decided to educate my brother and sister and I at home because she was so unhappy with her other options. And um, she started in 1972 when it wasn't actually legal. Um, hmm. And she it was sort of invented from scratch this education that she had wanted to have, but hadn't had, but mm-hmm. she wanted for us. And she created this classical education for us. Um, my mother's that's a fantastic educator. That's incredible. Yeah, th- yeah. that's how um, I first came across your name, which is true for many people, I'm sure, mm-hmm. is when I first came to Virginia and... Um, was teaching uh, a lot of home educated students and uh, your name was you know spoken with a lot of respect and reverence and I thought who is this Susan who Weisbauer this? yeah who is this well, look this up and I have to say that um, maybe because I'm uh, a snob I suppose uh, your your degrees and credentials they they can uh, they carried a lot of credibility with me so then I you know I gave a closer look and I was quite pleased to see the kinds of things you were doing and so that's uh that was my first encounter. I think for Jeff, maybe your brand new name is that right? Yeah, yeah. I um, I, I learned of uh, of you and your work kind of through David, and the same kind of thing. I was I was really impressed by the kind of the depth and breadth of your of your background, and uh, I was just looking at in addition to other things, your bio as it as it pops up on Amazon, and it's just it's incredible kind of the things that you've done. Um, I'm a musician myself, and so I I, I keyed in on that you were a, a professional musician. And I just thought that was so interesting. And um, but Jeff, you like to perform more than practice, well, right? It's the opposite. No, I, no, I, I'm okay with performing. I, in some ways, I'm much more happier to be alone in a room with my with my guitar than in front yeah. of people. I was curious when you were talking about that, Susan, uh, because you're also you're also a teacher, and I wonder if yet you know, your your distaste for performing music does that translate also as to a distaste for performing in the classroom, or is it a different animal to you? No, it's completely, it's a completely different thing. When you're, when you're teaching, you are storytelling. Mm. Um, You know, you're creating a beginning and a middle and an end. Uh, You're performing a one man play in the round, as it were, Um, that you're drawing, you're drawing your audience in, you're bringing them along with you. You are bringing them to a conclusion. And I always loved that. And I always loved the back and forth of teaching the time when I would toss something back over to the students, get their response, this very dynamic feel. Um, yeah. And that's what I didn't get in performing. Like I was a pianist, so I didn't, maybe if I had, had an orchestra instrument, I would have had that same sense huh. of collaboration and creating you know, a group experience, which I love about teaching. And, and actually, I, I taught at the College of William and Mary for nearly 20 years. Um, and I, I miss that, you know, I, you, you can teach three sections of the same class in the same day and each class period will be a completely different animal. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very true. It forms itself. There's an organic quality to it that I, I was always like, oh, what's going to happen today? I remember my office mate who, who'd also been teaching for nearly 20 years. I remember she was getting ready to go teach her writing class. She got up and she, she had her books and she, you know, she did the, the Star Trek tug on the front of the uniform, you know, pull down to get ready to go. And, um, 
And she said, as long as I've been doing this, I still get butterflies every time I walk. Uh, into the yes. Huh. And I, I love that so much. So have you heard of the distinction that's become very popular nowadays between uh, teaching as the sage on the stage as opposed to the guide on the side? Have you heard that language before? I'm not familiar with that language. No. Right. Well, I guess the old fashioned approach to pedagogy, which frankly is mine, just to put my cards on the table, is that the teacher is like the sage on the stage. So they're the person who has studied a lot. They've been deep in the books and they come with something to offer. And of course, there's the kind of interaction that you're talking about. Uh, but the, the spotlight in the classroom, and maybe this is vain, but the spotlight is typically on the instructor. And then it, it can roam around from student to student. Um, but the instructor is called upon to give a kind of performance. Um, now, the other, the other expression, the guide on the side, is that the, uh, the teacher presents herself or himself as um, another learner and comes alongside the student in a more of a joint venture. And I, th I think the second one is, is far more popular right now, but I'm a bit at a loss as to you know, if either is preferable. I wonder if you had an opinion. When you're doing not like TED Talks, but you're doing classroom teaching where you're with the same group of students, you know, for an extended period of time, I think you go back and forth between these two, sometimes even back and forth in the same session. Sure. Um, I don't think there's a bright line of distinction necessarily between them. I think if you're sensitive to what you're doing and you're sensitive to your students' reactions, you're going to flip back and forth as the material and their reactions dictate. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I, I kind of view it more like uh, catechizing in some ways. You know, you, you set out a certain amount of information, yeah. then you solicit the student's response, and then the, the next question or presentation has to be grounded in what their response was. So there's a, a sense of development throughout the, throughout the time together. I think one of the things that, um, and if I can speak for David, the one of the things that I think frustrates both David and I is that I think a lot of the, I like the, a lot of the language in my institution is about, they always say, you know, flipping the classroom. And so the you know in ways the students become the teacher and the and the and the teacher becomes the learner um, as a way of kind of kind of erasing that the, the distance between you know professor and student which I, I guess in some ways is admirable um, but it, it, in some ways that it could have also uh, takes away from the fact that um, you know, these professors are there because they have an expertise and and they they have a grounding in these things. They 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 know a lot more about this than the students do. And, and so I think sometimes that you know, I'm frustrated in which the way that that pendulum is is often kind of swung too far in the other direction. Well, I mean, we are we are in an age of an increasing disregard for expertise. Yes. And that pendulum, too, will eventually start to swing back in the other direction, but I don't think we're at the end of the arc yet. <laughs> Could you tell me what year that's going to happen? I, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'd like to be prepared. I have some ideas I'd, I'd like to have at the ready. It's been really fascinating. One of the, one of the sort of side effects of um, becoming known for home education, and I just to, to quickly sort of finish, finish up that particular story arc, um, my mother home educated us. I wanted to home educate my kids. I have four. They're now 29, 27, 24, and 20. Wow. Um, I've got only one still in college. And um, I wanted to home educate them. And so my mother and I put together this outline for what we wanted to do with them, both of us together over 12 years, because I, I'm sort of a linear thinker. So I was like, let's plan out all 12 years at once when my you know, oldest <laughs> was five years old. And that became the outline of the book, The Well-Trained Mind, A Guide to Classical Education at Home, which I think has gone through now four editions. You know, yes. every every six, seven years, we update um, all of the resources and add, you know, a new material to it. Right. So that book. OK, so I, I have to tell you, you'll, you'll appreciate this story. I have to tell you the story about how this book got published. So um, I had published a couple of novels and I had an agent. And I told him that I was putting this together. We, my agent and I were about the same age and we had kids about the same age. And I told him that we were putting this outline together. He had kids in the New York City public school system. And he said, boy, I'd really like to see that. So I sent it to him and he called me back and he said, this would be a fantastic book. Have you thought about turning it into a book proposal? Well, I'm a writer, that's what I do. So I was like, sure, I'll turn it into a book proposal. Sent it back to him and he sent it around. So he calls me up, he says, so I have really, really good news, um, W.W. Norton, you, you know, they do the big classroom anthologies. 
um, is interested in publishing this as a book. And, you know, they, they, they're, they're great firm because they're independent. They're actually not owned by conglomerate. They kind of go against the grain a little bit academically. Um, I think you should talk to them about it. And I said, sure. And he said, well, so here's the catch. They want you to come up to New York so that they can eyeball you first. <laughs> and I said, okay. Why I guess that's, that's better than nosing you, right? Or I guess, I guess so. like that. He said, they're just afraid you're going to be too weird to promote successfully. Because, uh, you know, there's the whole, you know, you, your husband's uh, a minister and you live on a farm and right, you're homeschooling. Yeah. And, you know, they just, they think that you're probably Bible beaters and, and they might not get along with you. And I, I said, okay, are they going to pay for it? He said, no. <laughs> so, so we had a big family conference and, you know, my mother and I decided we're going to go to New York. Um, she had never been. So I, I'd only been a couple of times at, at that point. So, you know, we we bought clothes and yeah. we went to New York um, and I was actually nine months pregnant with my youngest at the time, oh my gosh. Eight and a half months pregnant. It was quite the it, quite the out. Su Susan in the Big Apple, right? Oh, it's my a... goodness. Yeah, I felt like one, too. So we're, <laughs> we're no, seriously, being eight and a half months pregnant in Manhattan makes you feel like the wall of China. You can be. Yeah. <laughs> So we had this, you know, sat down in this office with all these senior editors and we had this conversation that just got progressively friendlier as they realized that, in fact, we were educators. You know, hmm. we weren't religious nutcases. We were educators. And there had apparently been a huge amount of resistance on the Norton editorial board hmm. towards bringing in religious people talking about homeschooling. They were huh. just like, this is completely off brand for us. Um, but, you know, our our book was intended for all parents. You know, right. It was not intended for a certain segment of religious parents of any kind. And, um, I, and Norton was very, very surprised when it started doing well. Right. Um, I'm, I'm sure they don't regret that decision now, right? <laughs> no, absolutely not. It was the yeah. beginning of a very long and fruitful relationship that then yeah. led to me going on to write quite a bit of history for them, mm -hmm. um, which is my true love. Um yeah. So anyway, congratulations on that extraordinary success. As soon as I heard the title, uh, this was 2000, I think 2001, the first time I had heard your name, I immediately said, there is a well titled book. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that was very nicely done. I assume you were responsible for the title, but you know, the combination of the title, the idea and your name, that was, uh, that was a stroke of genius. So congratulations. <laughs> Can't take responsibility for the name, but I will take responsibility for the title. Okay. Now, one of the things I, I find really interesting, and, and this might be going to be too big of a question for what we want to, uh, you know, talk about here, but you know, classical education is popping up uh, everywhere. I think there's there are particular places in the in the country where it's it's bigger th than others, but it seems to be on the whole kind of you know growing at the you know the K through 12 um, level, but but kind of dying on the vine in post secondary ed. And I'm just I'm just wondering if you've thought about that, if you have views on you know what's going on there, and why doesn't the why, why doesn't the one kind of translate into the other? Yeah, that is a really really interesting question. Um, so first of all, I would say that, and if you if you look at the well trained mind, you'll see this. What we describe in there, and we do give it the name classical education, um, is not actually classical education. It's, <laughs> it's a it's a traditional humanity-centered liberal arts education. Okay. Sure. So using using the word classical, I mean, it's not a misnomer, but it is not education in the classics as such. It's rooted in many of the same principles in terms of how you deal with language, how you deal with texts, the centrality of history, uh, the respect for past authoritative voices, tracing how those voices affect each other, you know, sort of looking chronologically over time at the way that an idea is taken, transformed, mutates, moved, passed on to the next generation. There's definitely a classical aspect to the methods of teaching, which is more like discipleship than it is hmm. like lecturing, you know. Yes. Um, but it is not education in the classics. It is a good, solid, traditional liberal arts education. Okay, um, okay. The problem is, is that nobody knows what liberal arts means anymore. Hmm. You're and, exactly right about that. And if you use the word liberal in any context, a lot of people just stop listening. Sure. Um, this again, this is, I mean, which is silly, but 
language matters. So in the first place, I don't think that the popularity of classical education has any direct relationship to the study of classics. <laughs> but then also, okay, I don't mean to sound too snotty about this, but no, please. Af- after the well-trained mind came out, a lot of curricula suddenly were calling themselves classical that had sure. never used the word before. So, uh. you know, it, you if you wanted to chart the growth of classical education accurately, you'd have to take some time to look at what people are actually doing. Because a lot of yeah. people who use the word classical um, are just using the word classical, and I'm not sure even they know exactly what they mean by it. Oh, that certainly has been my experience. I, I think we're kindred minds on this because, you know, I teach Greek and Latin and homeschool my own children mm-hmm. and uh, have known about aspects of this community or market uh, for a couple decades now. And I've often been at a loss for understanding exactly what people are after and why they're using the term classical so broadly. Yeah. So your comment's really helpful. Hmm. Um, I, I shouldn't therefore expect that when a person says classical, they're referring to Greek and Latin in mm-hmm. any way. No, absolutely. <laughs> I, that, that is that is not at all the case. Huh. Well, that's that's remarkable. Jeff, did you have a follow up on that? Because you you brought up the first. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the, the clarification that. Yeah. Like, as David said, that's really helpful. Um, so would you say that in terms of uh, like a liberal arts education, as you as you see it, as you teach it, as you promote it, it's more about the method than it is the the text being used and i wonder if that if you would think of any text that you would say would be indispensable to say uh you know kind of a core training in the humanities now that is a really great question so i would say that in the first place yes it is it it, it is i mean i don't think any classical educator and i'm using when when i talk to when i talk to parents when i talk to teachers because i i well, at least before I um, lived in my sweatpants for a year in my basement, <laughs> I used to you know, talk to a lot of teachers and parents at, at conferences. I would always begin by saying, so here are the aspects to classical education that I'm going to discuss. And really, if we're going to be honest, we should call this neoclassical education mm-hmm. because this is not what the Greeks and Romans were doing. And mm. if we were trying to do exactly what the Greeks and Romans were doing, it would not be very useful to us in the 21st century. Well, hold on. Hold on now. Hold on. I was with you for three quarters of the way. Then then I went off the ranch, so to speak. Uh, so to speak. Um you know, I just a lot of times when we talk about about recapturing ancient patterns, we don't stop to think about how different the fields of knowledge that we deal with now are. You know, that's fair. The, just the vast accumulation of things that we could learn about now requires us to make choices um, hmm. in a way that was not necessary in, during classical times. That's an excellent point. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, um, so I start out by saying let's use let's start using the word neoclassical because for one thing, if you don't, then you end up in these discussions about well, what is the most classical education? And mm. I just find that I am I am not an educational theory um, geek at all. I can get I can I can start on educational theory and I can talk about it because I'm. You know, I can read, so I know what what it means. Sure. I just get so bored. I hmm. want to say, well, let's just let's stop now and go actually actually teach some students. You know, yeah, get on with the people. <laughs> so, um, so I, I say that, and then I say, no classical educator would ever say that it doesn't matter what you study. Right. Okay. This is not a content free method here. They, they, you know, the content is vitally important. So it's not like it's not like Dewey, for example. No, uh, exactly. On the other hand, it's also not like the the E. D. Hirsch, what your fifth grader should know, what your sixth grader should know, what your seventh grader should know model, which says, in order to be an educated person, here is the body of knowledge you must master. Hmm. I do not think that that is compatible with the classical mindset, because the classical mindset is about asking, exploration, finding the question that hasn't been asked yet. Um, you know, it's, it is about teaching minds to not settle for simply received information, but to say, what hasn't yet been explored? What hasn't yet been asked? You know, you look at Aristotle, who, by the way, would not necessarily be 
on my list of, you know, texts that you must read in order to be an educated human being. (laughs) There we go again, Susan. (laughs) At least you have to know what he was doing. This is why I I think Aristotle is ranks higher in my in my pantheon than Plato. Aristotle was the one who for the first time said, why do things change? Plato believed that all change was decay because Mm -hmm. change leads you further and further away from the ideal. Yes. Aristotle was the one who not only said, let's interrogate that, but said, why does change happen? You know, why does a kitten become a cat? Mm-hmm. Why does a seed become a tree? Mm-hmm. What is the mechanism there? Now, that to me is just the that is just the most shining example of what it means to be classically educated, mm. to have a firm enough grasp of what people who came before you have said, to find the the hole, to find the gap, um, to find the place where they didn't ask the question. Plato never said, why do things change? Hmm. Hmm. And what does that change mean? Right. So, you know, so for Aristotle to make change really be the center of his philosophy meant that he opened the door to science. We would not Mm -hmm. have science if it were not for Aristotle. Right, right. We wouldn't have evolution if it weren't for Aristotle. We wouldn't have Darwinism if it weren't for Aristotle. We wouldn't. There are so there are so many things that would not have happened if he had not asked that question. Hmm. So, if that is what a classical education brings, then we can't ever reduce it to a set of information right. that has to be mastered. Well, that's an excellent point. That's that's really well said. I don't want to cut you off. Um, you know, the, the famous painting, I like to use this to illustrate uh, what you're talking about, the difference between Plato and Aristotle. Raphael's The School of Athens with mm-hmm. Plato and Aristotle in the middle, and Plato is on the viewer's left, pointing up toward the sky, right? Look at the forms. Aristotle is on the viewer's right, kind of palming a basketball, but point, <laughs> pointing down to the earth, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, examine, study, look at what's going on down here. Yeah. And, uh that that's often a helpful image. Yeah, I've also I've also thought that if you know if you to go back in time, you to pick one of those two guys to hang out with, you're going to hang out with Aristotle. Oh, absolutely. I have your bio pinned up here on, on our board here, Susan, and um, you're way more like Aristotle than Plato, <laughs> and just in terms of the you, know, the, the you know the various things that you're interested in and have done, and um, but yeah, I mean, if you're going to go grab a drink with somebody. Aristotle? Aristotle over Plato any day. Yeah. Th- yeah. The most brilliant biologist ever to write on literature. <laughs> exactly right. 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 And our conversation with Susan will continue after we hear from our sponsors. Listen up carefully, ladies and gentlemen. Ratio Coffee. Today's episode is brought to you in part by Ratio Coffee of Portland, Oregon. Mark Helweg and his team have solved all the problems you might have with a good coffee and countertop aesthetics. Why spend, I ask you, four to six dollars on coffee purchased in a drive through in a paper cup when you can brew better coffee at home? The Ratio 6 and its big brother, the beautiful Ratio 8, these are automatic pour-over machines that consistently brew the finest java. That's right, Dave. The Ratio sends 200-degree Fahrenheit water soaring through its metallic veins, There's no plastic in this beast. Down into the cone filled with freshly ground coffee beans. It then sits in the bloom stage for a few minutes, allowing all of the harsh CO2 to float lazily off into the biosphere. Then it is deposited in the hand-blown borosilicate glass or stainless steel carafe. No bitterness, no burned flavor, no brackish tang, just consistent sweet coffee. We're going to keep the brackish tang out of it once again. Uh, we're, as far away as possible. Okay, all right. So listen up, all of you lovers of coffee. Go to RatioCoffee.com right now and get a 15% exclusive discount on the Ratio 6. Enter special code ANCO for 15% off the Ratio 6. That's RatioCoffee.com. Check it out today. Today's episode is also brought to you by the good people at Odd Ostra Coffee Roasters of Hillsdale, Michigan. To the stars with great coffee. That's right, Jeff. Patrick Whalen and his crew down there in South Central Michigan, they roast some delicious beans. Indeed they do, Dave. The poetry series featuring Stevens, Rilke, and Wordsworth, plus the Las Lajas Microlot and Tenebris. These are extraordinary blends. Oh, I love the Tenebris, the dark shadows of coffee. That that really hits me. That's my me. favorite. Yep. Yeah, listeners, if you haven't checked out their website, you should take a look how they roast the beans in an old-fashioned way. 
and all of their beans rate 84 or higher on the 100-point coffee grading scale. That's good, right? You, you give out a lot of Bs, don't you, Winkle? I do, all, all the time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. So this, But the 84 on their scale, this is an A. This right? is well above average. Well this above. is great stuff. So what should they do to get some deals as uh, ad nauseum listeners? Well, they go to oddostraroasters.com, oddostra, A-D-A-S-T-R-A, roasters.com. And check out everything they have to offer there. You get 10% off by entering the code ANAA in the coupon code box. And you can also sign up for their monthly subscription. Check it out. This episode of Ad Nauseum is brought to you by Hackett Publishing. Since 1972, Hackett has been setting the standard for affordable, high-quality translations in the field of classics, as well as many other areas of the humanities. Dave, what do you like about Hackett's stuff? I think they have some incredibly fine translations. They're idiomatic without sacrificing accuracy. They cover a wide range of authors, both ancient and early modern. I've often used Descartes in the philosophy class I've been able to teach once in a while or the translation of the Republic. We've featured Stanley Lombardo's excellent Odyssey translation right, yeah. on the last few episodes. Yep. And I especially love the Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata series written by uh, Hans Orberg. Excellent stuff. Excellent. And that's another, that's a text what hopefully we're going to be talking about in an episode coming up. That's hopefully. right, in the future yes. when we uh, unload on various Latin curricula. Sounds great. So what, do, what can our Ian listeners um, get? from Hackett. What special deal? I'm so glad you asked, Jeff. (laughs) They need to go to hackettpublishing.com, H-A-C-K-E-T-T. Check out what they have there. If you're John Dacre, you should go there especially, (laughs) H-A-C-K-E-T-T. Enter the code AN2021 in the box, which asks for the coupon code, and you will get 20% off plus free shipping. 20% and free shipping. That's a great deal. Don't hesitate. I love that how you put that, that, you know, Aristotle's the, the first uh, person to ask, you know, why do things change? And I love, another thing I love about Aristotle, he was the first to kind of look at things like tragedy and say, why do we do this, right? You know, why, why do we have this art form? What does it mean? What is it doing for us? And so he's, he's just, he's moving the ball further down the field. Yeah. So shall we talk about Hippocrates uh, today, which is one of uh, your burgeoning or perhaps longtime interests? I, I, you know, I wouldn't say that it, it's even Hippocrates so much, although I'm fascinated by the Hippocratic um, method, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. But my whole interest in Hippocrates and medicine generally, I grew up in a medical family. My, my father ran an ER for 40 years, and I've, I've just always been fascinated by how medical practice develops. But what happened was, I'm just briefly, Sorry, there's a bit of a chronology here. After we published The Well-Trained Mind, one of the things that we couldn't find was a narrative world history for kids. They were all sort of encyclopedic or they Mm. were just American histories or I couldn't find a good narrative world history. And so I thought, well, I'll write one. So I wrote a four volume world history series. It's called The Story of the World. And I asked Norton, who had published The Well-Trained Mind, if they would publish it and they said well we don't really do kids books but why don't you form your own publishing company and we'll distribute it for you oh wow so we did so we founded a publishing company it was originally named peace hill press because the farm where i live the family farm is peace hill um and then eventually we changed it to well-trained mind press to hook it back into the well-trained mind and also because we kept getting manuscript submissions for like new age (laughs) <laughs> meditation practices <laughs> so it turned out to be not the best name um, right and after so i i published this this story of the world series and it has just i mean it has just people just keep reading it it has hmm. it's it's coming up on we're coming up on our 20th anniversary of the series it has over a million copies in print man um people were longing for this narrative world history that's just sort of you know paints paints a big picture so that you can then fit all the little bits into it. So because it did so well, my editor at Norton asked me if I would if I would do the same thing for adults. And I said, you want me to write a history of the entire world <laughs> for adult readers? He was like, well, yeah. So it's a universal history, right? Like yeah. uh, what Augustine told Orosius to do. You know, go, go write a universal history. Go write uh, a universal history. Only take a few months. <laughs> That's what he said. He said, he said, well, you know, it hasn't hasn't been done since Will and Ariel Durand's, and that's very, you know, it's that's sure. dated now. So, so, yeah, a history of the whole world. How long do you think it would take you? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, 
10 years? I don't know. So uh, so I did a deal with Norton to write a world history in four volumes for grownups. And I got through three volumes. It's, I've, I've done the history of the ancient world, history of the medieval world, history of the Renaissance world, but I've only gotten up to the fall of Constantinople. Mm, so okay. I'm clearly not going to do it in four volumes. And then I had to take a break and figure out how I was going to do, you know, from the printing press on, the source problem becomes huge. Yes, it's enormous. It's just absolutely, I've got to take a different approach. So I took a little break from that series uh, to try to figure out, and I, I think I have it figured out. I think I'm going to be doing the history of the modern world, part one and part two, two volumes. First one would go from the fall of Constantinople to the invention of the steam engine, which is actually the, that is a huge transition point in human history. Hmm. And then the second volume from the steam engine up to, I don't know yet. Anyway, hmm. I'm saying all of this because I have spent the last 15 years researching and writing world history. And I was always just sort of gobsmacked by the throwaway lines about how people die. Hmm. Um, you know, so this, this particular king died of an abscess at the back of his throat. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, people die from hemorrhoids. People yes, it's not infrequent, die, I understand. People die from the most incredible variety of things that sound horribly painful, by the way. Like and, listening to a podcast, for example. <laughs> I hope not. Com one. Common way. Um, and, I'm sorry. And nobody ever pays any attention to it. You just get these throwaways of how people die. And I'm thinking, you know, first of all, if you die of hemorrhoids, this has to have affected your life for right. quite a long time before yeah. the end. And we live in these bodies. Well, what did that change? How did that affect what what else was going on? How did that change foreign policy? How did that change what wars were declared? There, There is so little attention paid to people's physical experiences in history when you're doing world history. Hmm. So I started collecting tales of sickness and hmm. what makes people sick and how people think about it and how that changes the way we look at everything else. Hmm. And the more research I did on it, the more convinced I was that our feelings about what make us sick um, become a lens that affects the way we look at our, our politics, the way we look at God, the way we look at each other. It's an idea that I've been working on for a very long time, and I finally got it into book proposal form, and I sold it to St. Martin's Press, because Norton, what, it just wasn't their thing. Sold right. it to St. Martin's Press literally the month before lockdown. Oh. So I've spent the last year trying to research sickness and how it changes the way we look at the world in the mm, middle wow. of this pandemic, and it has been the most surreal experience excellent timing <laughs> uh, i don't think, uh, well the timing is what it is yes of course. um I, I don't know that it's been ideal you know it's it's been a very difficult topic to research but what has really fascinated me is this sort of central shift that happens starting with hippocrates and ending with germ theory so before hippocrates if you get sick it's something from the outside that's causing it. It's mm -hmm. a demon. It's a displeased God. Um, it's a spell. It's an unhappy ancestor. It's mm -hmm. something from the outside that is coming in and making you sick. And that actually has a name. It's called the disease entity model. Okay. Disease is a thing. You can identify it. It's, it's like, you know, you can put your hands on it. You can isolate it and you can do something about it. Right. You can, you can drive it out. Hippocrates comes along and, you know, airs, waters, and places, this sort of seminal Hippocratic text says, no, 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 no. There is no such thing as disease. So in Hippocratic medicine, there is no such thing as a disease. There are sick people. And the reason why you're sick is because your body is interacting with this whole variety of physical factors around you in a way that is unbalancing it hmm. and making it to be unwell. So does this become the theory of the humors then? Yes. Yeah, okay. I mean, and yes, yeah, so the theory of the humors is you have these four humors that are coursing through your body and right. then 
one of them gets out of balance, it causes certain symptoms. And in order to get it back in balance, you have to look at your environment, you have to adjust what you eat, what you drink, the temperatures, um, the winds, what direction the winds are coming from, the humidity, all of these different things. So in this way of looking at sickness, which lasts until 19, what, 18, 1890 something. Okay, so yeah. it's 2000 years of human history. There is this intense focus on individual bodies and how they interact with the environment. Then germ theory. We have, you know, there, there are a series of names associated with this Lister, right. Pasteur, right? All of these guys, the, these late 19th century guys. Um, partly related to an improvement in lab techniques so that you right. can start to isolate microbes. Germ theory comes along and says, no, actually, we're going to go all the way back to the disease entity model. Hmm. Germ theory has a lot more in common with ancient Sumerian and ancient Egyptian medicine than it does with the 2000 years that came before. Hmm. The thing that's making you sick is an external thing that is coming into you from the outside. And what we have to do is isolate it and figure out how to fight it. And mm. then that will make you well. So after 2000 years of human history, in less than a century, we change everything about how we think about what makes us sick. That's a dramatic shift, isn't it? It's dramatic and it takes place over a very short period of time. Right. And, you know, Hippocrates lingers. I, I you know, I, I've got kids, you guys have kids. I have heard come out of my mouth. Don't go outside barefoot in the snow. You'll catch cold. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's, yeah. Hippoc that's Hippocrates. He's still right. with us. You know, that's the interaction of your body with the environment is going to create an illness. And then we'll, you know, have to wrap you up and feed you chicken soup um, mm -hmm. and steam your head, all of which are Hippocratic, <laughs> right. uh, in order to make you better. Um, you know, in the disease, disease entity model, you can take a pill. Right. To it's, combat it's, the external vector that has somehow come into your ecosystem where it's not yeah. supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. So, so these are very, these are two radically opposed ways of looking at the relationship between our body and the world. Hmm. And you know, with with once we move out of the Hippocratic era, like I say, it's about 1890. There is this intense period of fear between 1890 and about 1945 when we know the germs are out there but we can't do anything about them because we right. don't have antibiotics right right this intense time of fear of each other because we know that we can pass them germs to each other this intense fear of our surroundings this is the area era in which uh, we invent saran wrap hmm. um in order to you know keep everything separate right it, it is the era of segregation because mm. it was thought that different bodies played host to different kinds of germs. Ah. So a person of your own race was less likely to make you sick than a person of another race. Hmm. It's the um, era of eugenics also. It's, it's right? the era of eugenics. It's the era of household cleanliness when the idea of the modern housewife was right. invented because it was her duty to keep the house germ free in order to protect her family. Right. I was reading about the dishwasher, the the uh, kitchen appliance recently. And apparently at first the dishwasher was not successful. It couldn't be sold because people enjoyed the social aspects of cleaning up together after dinner. Mm. But it, you probably know this anecdote, but it wasn't until the manufacturers convinced people that uh, a machine washing dishes was more sanitary than doing it yourself, that suddenly it took off very rapidly. Yeah, this period between the discovery of germs and the invention of antibiotics has is really the foundation for a lot of what we think of as normal modern life. Um, mm. Paper plates, styrofoam cups, um, those little individual pop and sip communion things. Right. Yeah. <laughs> those were invented <laughs> in the 1920s huh. um, so that people wouldn't pass germs to each other. There's so many things that changed that then we don't go back and rethink them necessarily and say, oh, we, why are we doing this? Where did this come from? Hmm. Do you think there'll be like a Hegelian synthesis between the two different models at some point? Or are people already suggesting that kind of thing? It's it's both the, the disease entity model mm -hmm. and the, the humors model that both have to be paid attention to? There's been a little bit of a move back towards it. So anything sort of whole body wholeness wellness 
movements, you know, uh, intense mm-hmm. focus on diet, focus on environment. I think we have seen attempts to to move back and recapture some of the more holistic aspects of Hippocratic medicine, an mm-hmm. acknowledgement that antibiotics won't fix everything. But I, we we have a very we have a very powerful and well funded pharmaceutical industry uh, in the West, which has you know, a vested interest in labeling sort of whole body wellness as kooky. Right. Mm. And it doesn't help that a lot of the very vocal people who are practicing various aspects of whole body wellness actively reject pharmaceuticals, vaccines, Mm. for example. Yes. Right, right. You know, so so right now we've got, as in so many other areas of American life, at least, we've got two pretty well-defined sides that are unwilling to listen to each other. Well, we'll see what happens next year. We'll see what happens with the vaccine. Um, If the COVID vaccine does indeed, um, you know, tamp down the pandemic and make it possible to resume normal life, then the pharmaceutical industry is going to do a big old victory lap. If vaccine injuries start popping up more frequently, then it's going to have the opposite effect. Um, but I don't know that that's going to promote whole body wellness so much as entrench people in the rejection, not the embrace of whole body wellness, but the rejection of pharmaceuticals, which is not right. quite the same thing. So I think we're still very much in the middle of that. Right. It'll be probably bias of selection, right? The kind of evidence that either proves or disproves the positions people already hold, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I would say so, yes. Hmm. So all of this work on, uh, you know, the disease entity model and so forth that you're doing, this is coming out in a book, correct? And what, mm-hmm. what's the what's the timeline and the prospects for that, if we may well, ask? Well, it was, the manuscript was supposed to be done in May, which is not going to happen, as is typical for a big project. Um, I'm hoping to have the manuscript in by fall so that it will be out in 2022. Mm-hmm. Um, working title is, is Blood, Bones, and Breath. Uh, breath was the third breath. One? Yes. Excellent. I don't think that. Yes. I don't, I, I'm not crazy about that. That's the publisher's vote. So we'll, we'll see what it ends up with. I, my working title for it, it this isn't a great title either, but it works for me is black box oh. because that's what the body was for right. so many centuries is right. you, you, you do. I mean, Hippocratic medicine does all of these things to try to make the body better without having any idea what's actually going on in there. Yes. So. Kind of similar to Darwin's view of the cell, apparently, that it was a, an albuminous lump, right? It yes. was just nobody yeah. knew exactly what it was. But. And then magic happens. Correct. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Susan, would you, would you say that um, one of the things about Hippocrates is that we don't know a lot about him right. in terms of his, his biography, and um, his first biography pops up at, uh, you know, during the Roman era. Does Hippocratic ideas about medicine and disease uh, really hold sway um, kind of all up until like the 19th century, as you, as you were saying, in the way that you know Aristotle's view of the of the cosmos held sway until Copernicus and Galileo come along, yep. um, or are there kind of incremental uh, gains and changes with with guys like Galen and Celsus? You know, well, I mean, I think Celsus is mostly, I, in my opinion, an encyclopedist, which is great. I mean, it's very useful for us, but he was a collector, not a an innovator. I mean, I mm-hmm. think you have more innovation when we get to Galen, which is that Hippocratic Hippocratic medicine was really focused on environment and diet, and not the the Hippocratic tradition until Galen didn't do all that much with with drugs. Um, it was it was more about the you know the things that you do in your natural daily life, adjusting mm-hmm. those. So I think what Galen really brings to the equation is a much more focused attention to what particular, you know, herbal compounds and and sort of what we might think of as artificially produced drugs combinations not necessarily found in nature. Hmm. Yeah. How that can add and how that can how that can help the body. And I think it's an important step forward because pure Hippocratic medicine is all about restoring the natural balance. Mm-hmm. So you only are going to use natural elements. Yeah. You know, the 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 Hippocratic oath for the physician where at first do no harm, that's what that means. Your job is to stand by and let nature 
do its job without messing with it too much. Ah, right. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. Hmm. It, it doesn't actually mean don't kill. It does mean don't kill people. But the, <sighs> yeah. the you know, the idea was, is you're you're holding nature's hand. You're not getting in there and messing with it. Right. And Galen. So Galen actually, in a way, is a departure from first do no harm. Galen is first. Darn it. Let's figure out this anatomy and do <laughs> some drugs. <laughs> yeah. 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 So but but he's still working in a Hippocratic framework. Gotcha. You know, you still don't have a disease entity. Hmm. And with Galen, still, you see what persists until the 19th century, which is that there's still no such thing as a disease. Tuberculosis can turn into typhoid fever. Hmm. Um, you know, smallpox can turn into something else, depending hmm. on the interactions of the body with the environment around it. Hmm. Yeah. So hmm. that doesn't change. Which could be viewed, I suppose, sympathetically as similar to a, a precedent theory for mutation of viruses and such, even though yeah, I'm sure it's scientifically inaccurate, but a way to salvage the idea. Well. Or not. I mean, <laughs> you know, the, the difference between Hippocratic medicine, by which I do mean everything up until the 1880s, 1890s, and what we do now is there's a lot more Hippocratic medicine is a lot more humane, it's hmm. a lot more human because it actually matters who your patient is. Your patient is never a number. Right, yeah. You have to actually listen to your patient. You have to pay attention to their habits. Um, you have to pay attention to who they are and what they do. And with the disease entity model, none of that matters. Mm -hmm. you know? um, hmm. It's a germ, we know what to do about it. Yeah. It, doesn't so, so matter. it doesn't matter who you are. Right. Descartes must have played a large role in this. It probably goes beyond what we can talk about today, but the, you know, the body as a machine with all these inner mechanisms, uh, he, he must play a part in this, in, in going toward the disease entity model and away from Hippocrates. I'm not sure, to tell you the truth. I mean, certainly Descartes always important. Certainly he encouraged the impulse to look outside the body at what else there was. Mm -hmm. Right. But of the direct relationship, I'm not sure. That's actually something that I've still got to do quite a bit of work on. Hmm. Hmm. Well, we want to be uh, respectful of your time this afternoon, Susan. And so we should probably start, uh, look to wrapping up pretty soon here. But one question we both had uh, in an earlier email, our, our first communication, you talked about lambing season. And, uh, <laughs> yes. I mean, we'd, we'd be just thrilled to hear a little bit about how that's coming, whether it's wrapped up and what are some of the uh, particular literary challenges of lambing if there are any <laughs> okay so uh so i live on a family farm it's been in the family for many many generations it's 100 acres here in virginia hmm. and we do uh, we do small scale varied farming so we have uh, wool goats angora goats you shear them and you get mohair and we have luster long wool sheep which are a heritage breed that were actually developed for virginia Hmm. And we have um, cows, we have ducks, we have chickens. Um, I'm forgetting animals here. When I oh pigs, we have pigs, we have donkeys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, so and we have we have apple trees, we have peach trees, we have uh, you know rotating pastures, we have silvo pasture. We we're really doing our best to be responsible towards the land mm -hmm. and um, use it in a way that is productive. We do our own meat that we um, we kill the animals ourselves here on the farm. I'm not a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. So to be a responsible meat eater, you kind of need to know what goes into meat. And I'll tell mm -hmm. you, if you kill and process your own meat, you end up <laughs> eating a lot less of it because it is such hard work. Yeah, yeah. There's I've done so that. much effort that goes into it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is it's part of it is part of my attempt to, you know, live a genuine life. Um, and to pay some attention to where the things that I use come from. Mm -hmm. We have uh, goats and sheep gestate for five months. So we put the guys in with the girls in October for six weeks and then take them out. That's the most wonderful time of the year for them. And then <laughs> right. they go back into bachelor quarters for the rest of the year. They're like, oh, so sad now. No and all the away. girls and all the girls say, hooray, they're gone. <laughs> Um, so five months after that, we have six weeks of lambing and kidding. And a lot of people who do commercial meat and wool, like we do, they have, they lamb in February. 
I can't do it. Once my youngest kid went to college and it was pretty much just me on the nights and weekends, I was like, I am not getting up in 15 yeah. degree weather and going <laughs> no out doubt. No to doubt. take care of these sheep. So I, I have shifted our breeding season. And so we are going to actually start that uh, first possible kidding date is next week. Oh, okay. And the so weather is then warmer, right? And spring is in the air. This is why we do it at this time of year because right. everything yeah. seem, everything is a lot less dire when mm. it's not 15 degrees. Well, you yeah. guys are in Michigan. You know that. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> we, we know. When, when do you find time to write, though? I guess you must just uh, sneak it in here and there amidst other chores. Part of, part of living on a farm um, is realizing that you do different kinds of work at different times of the year. Mm -hmm. And that sounds obvious, but it's a difficult adjustment to make. I think all of us like to get into a routine and stay there. Mm -hmm. And when you live on a farm, you can't. So I write a lot more in the winter than I do in the spring. And I write a lot more in the summer than I do in the fall. Hmm. Um, and you just have to get used to that. So I won't do a whole lot of writing during lambing season. Hmm. My routine is I pop up at five in the morning and go out and check and see if anybody's dropped a lamb that I have to take care of. <laughs> And if they haven't, then I go back in and write for three hours until I go back out, meet my, I have a farm manager, thank goodness. I meet and meet him for morning chores. But if I go out at five o'clock and there's three lambs there, then that's it for the day. Yeah. We're finished. Huh. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I, I, maybe Jeff has something else, but I had just a, a final question for myself. And that is uh, many of our listeners will know you from your pedagogy. Um, is there any uh, advice or encouragement that you would give to people who are uh, pursuing the kind of classical education that you've become famous for? Be willing to let it unfold over time. Mm -hmm. um, you can't hurry wisdom. It unfolds as you continue every day to do a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. Okay, I, I'm, I'm sticking on a classical reference here. I can't remember. It may have indeed been Aristotle who said that. It was Aristotle who says, you know, <laughs> one robin doesn't make a spring. Uh -huh. Happiness, right? Happiness is not a thing that happiness only happens over the course of an entire lifetime. Right. Yes. Happiness isn't a matter of having a spell of happiness. It's something mm. you develop over an entire lifetime. Mm. And uh, learning is the same. Hmm. Well said. Thank you. Yes. Jeff? One book does not make a scholar. We'll, we'll right. paraphrase Aristotle. As I'm you know, sitting here listening to you, I, I have a ton more questions, of course, I, I would love to ask uh, um, about Hippocrates and, and everything else. But in the interest of time, I think we need to let you go. And just a big thanks for joining us today. This was great. Nice to talk to you guys. Yeah, thank nice you so you. much, Susan. This was wonderful. We really appreciate you, uh, you taking the time and your generosity with us. Sure. Nice to talk to you guys. Bye-bye. Well, that wraps things up with Susan. We're so glad that she joined us today. Now, Jeff, we don't really have to get out of the vomitorium, do we? No, not today. I don't think there's anybody coming in. There's nobody on the on the whiteboard. No, there's no uh, Bonsai Fantasy Club. No. There's no Tri-State Bagpipe Appreciation Team and such. But No. But we want to leave, don't we? We want to leave. This is a terrible place for landing. Right? So. <laughs> so let's let's get out of the vomitorium. We have to say thank you to our wonderful sound engineer, Miss Mishka Fernando. Mishka. We want to say thank you to the gentleman that provided the intro and outro music, the uh, fantastic and generous musicians, Mr. Ken Tamplin and Scott Van Zen. They rock indeed. They do. And for the first time, we're going to say thank you to Mr. Brian DeYoung, the intro voice of the vomitorium. Yes. Thank you, Brian. Much appreciated. And do we want to say anything about the Moss Method? Is there anything really left to say about the Moss of Method? Of course. Well, come on. Tell us about the Moss Method, All right. David. You want to study Greek. You yeah. want to be able to read some of Aristotle and Hippocrates and Galen and the other persons we mentioned during this episode. Go to mossmethod.com, M-O-S-S, mossmethod.com. A rolling stone gathers a lot of Greek. And, and if they go there, what do they get? Oh, they get the chance to sign up for my course. Ooh, yes. Two ninety nine per module. Take you from neophyte to erudite in uh, less time than it would take to contract a disease. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, how can you pass that up? Exactly. Right. And Dave, I think you've got our gustatory sign-off today. I do, but Jeff, where are we going next week? Oh, yes, of course. Next week. Next week it's back to the Odyssey. Yeah. It, yes. And we're talking about this is my my favorite book in the whole in the whole epic. Book eleven. Book eleven, the Nequia. Nequia, the, the descent to the underworld. Things of the dead. I think we're gonna include some spooky sound effects. Oh yeah. Are you capable of that? I think we're trying. All right. You know, uh, Halloween is only what, eleven months away. So the corner. we're gonna sneak right in there. Yeah. And I do get the gustatory parting shot. This comes from the Chinese philosopher, 20th century, Mr. Lin Yutang. He says, what is patriotism but the love of the food one ate as a child? Love it. Thanks for listening.